Institute lens through which control is exercised. Profiling is a technique developed in 1922 on command of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, RIIA. Major John Rawlings Rees, a British Army technician, was instructed to set up the largest brainwashing facility in the world at the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations as a part of Sussex University. This became the core of Britain's Psychological Warfare Bureau. When I first introduced the names of Rees and Tavistock into the United States in 1970, very little interest was shown. But over the years, as I revealed more and more about Tavistock and its vital role in the conspiracy, it has become popular to imitate my earlier research. Britain's Psychological Warfare Bureau made extensive use of the work done by Rees on his 80,000 British Army guinea pigs, captive soldiers who underwent many forms of testing. It was Tavistock-designed methods that got the United States into the Second World War work and done which, by under the guidance of Dr. Kurt Lewin, established the there. US, the forerunner of the CIA. Lewin became the director of the Strategic Bomber and which, which was a plan for the Royal Air Force to concentrate on bombing German worker housing while leaving military targets, such as munition plants, alone. The munition plants on both sides belonged to the international bankers who had no wish to see their assets destroyed. Later, after the war was over, NATO ordered Sussex University to establish a very special brainwashing centre which became part of Britain's Psychological Warfare Bureau only now. Its research was directed toward civilian rather than military applications. We shall return to that super-secret unit which was called Science Policy Research Institute SPREE, under our chapters on drugs. The idea behind saturation bombing of civilian worker housing was to break the morale of the German worker. It was not designed to affect the war effort against the German military machine. Lewin and his team of actuaries reached a target figure, that if 65% of German worker housing was destroyed by nightly RAF bombing, the morale of the civilian population would collapse. The actual document was prepared by the Prudential Assurance Company. The RAF, under the command of Bomber Harris, carried out Lewin's plans, culminating in the terrifier storm bombing of Dresden, in which over 125,000, mainly old men, women and children, were killed. The truth of Bomber Harris's horror raids on German civilians was a well-kept secret until long after the end of WW2. Tavistock provided most of the detailed programs that led to the establishing of the Office of Naval Intelligence, ONI, the number one intelligence service in the United States, one which dwarfs the CIA in size and scope. Contracts worth billions of dollars were given to Tavistock by the United States government and Tavistock's strategic planners provide most of what the Pentagon uses for our defense establishment, even today. Here again is illustrated the grip the Committee of 300 has on the United States, and the majority of our institutions. Tavistock runs over 30 research institutions in the United States, all of which we will name in our charts at the end of the book. These Tavistock U.S. Institutions have in many cases grown into gargantuan monsters, penetrating every aspect of our government agencies and taking command of all policy making. One of Tavistock's chief wreckers of our way of life was Dr. Alexander King, a founder member of NATO and a favorite with the Committee of 300, as well as an outstanding member of the Club of Rome. Dr. King was assigned by the Club of Rome to destroy America's education by taking control of the National Teachers Association and working in close conjunction with certain lawmakers and judges. If it was not generally known how all-pervading is the influence of the Committee of 300, this book should dispel every vestige of that doubt. The trial run for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, a Club of Rome creation came in a test run against the nuclear power station at Three Mile Island, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Termed an accident by the hysterical media, this was not an accident but a deliberately designed crisis test for FEMA. An additional benefit was the fear and hysteria created by the news media, which had people fleeing the area when in fact they were never in any danger. It was considered a success by FEMA and it scored a lot of points for the anti-nuclear forces. 
TMI became the rallying point for the so-called environmentalists, a highly financed and controlled group run out of Aspen Institute on behalf of the Club of Rome. Coverage was provided, free of charge by William Paley of CBS Television, a former British intelligence agent. FEMA is a natural successor to the strategic bombing survey of WW2. Dr. Kurt Lewin, theoretician for what the Tavistock conspirators called crisis management, was deeply involved in the study. There is an unbroken chain between Lewin and Tavistock that stretches back for 37 years. Lewin incorporated the strategic bombing survey into FEMA, with only a few small adjustments proving necessary, one of the changes being the target, which was no longer Germany but the United States of America. Forty-five years after the end of WW2 it is still Tavistock that has its hands on the trigger, and the weapon is pointed at the United States. The late Margaret Mead conducted an intensive study of the German and Japanese population, under the aegis of Tavistock, on how they reacted to stress caused by aerial bombardment. Irving Janus was an associate professor on the project which was supervised by Dr. John Rawlings Rees, promoted to Brigadier General in the British Army. The test results were given to FEMA. The Irving Janus report was of great value in formulating FEMA policies. Janus used it in a book which he later wrote entitled Air War and Stress. The ideas in his book were followed to the letter by FEMA during the Three Mile Island crisis. Janus had a really simple idea, simulate a succession of crises and manipulate the population following the Lu and terror tactics and they will do exactly as required. In carrying out this exercise, Lewin discovered something new, that social control on a wide scale can be achieved by using the news media to bring home the horrors of a nuclear war via the television media. It was discovered that women's magazines were very effective in dramatizing the terrors of a nuclear war. A trial run conducted by Janus had Betty Bumpers, wife of St. Arthur Dale Bumpers of Arkansas, writing for McCall's magazine on that subject. The article appeared in McCall's January 1983 issue. ACTU ally, Mrs. Bumpers did not write the article, it was created for her by a group of writers at Tavistock whose speciality such subject matters are. It was a collection of untruths, non-facts, innuendos and conjectures based entirely upon false premises. The Bumpers article was typical of the kind of psychological manipulation at which Tavistock is so very good. Not one of the ladies who read McCall's could have failed to be impressed by the terror horror story of what a nuclear war looks like. The Committee of 300 has a major bureaucracy at its disposal made up of hundreds of think tanks and front organizations that run the whole gamut of private business and government leaders. I will mention as many as I can fit in, starting with the German Marshall Fund, its members, and remember they are also members of NATO and the Club of Rome, consist of David Rockefeller of Chase Manhattan Bank, Gabriel Haig of the prestigious manufacturers Hanover Trust and Finance Corporation, Milton Katz of the Ford Foundation, Willie Brandt, leader of Socialist International, KGB agent and member of the Committee of 300, Irving Bluestone, chairman of the United Auto Workers Executive Board, Russell Train, U. S. President of the Club of Rome and Prince Philip's World Wildlife Fund, Elizabeth Midgley, CBS Programs Producer, B. R. Gifford, Director of the Russell Sage Foundation, Guido Goldman of the Aspen Institute, the late Avril Harriman, Committee of 300 Extraordinary Member, Thomas L. Hughes of the Carnegie Endowment Fund, Dennis Meadows and Jay Forrestor of MIT, World Dynamics. The Committee of 300, although in existence for over 150 years, did not take on its present form until around 1897. It was always given to issuing orders through other fronts, such as the Royal Institute for International Affairs. When it was decided that a superbody would control European affairs, the RIIA founded the Tavistock Institute, which in turn created NATO. For five years NATO was financed by the German Marshall Fund. 
Perhaps the most important member of the Bilderbergers, a foreign policy body of the committee, was Joseph Rettinger, said to have been its founder and organizer, whose annual meetings have delighted conspiracy hunters for several decades. Rettinger was a well-trained Jesuit priest and a 33rd degree Freemason. Mrs. Catherine Mayer Graham, who is suspected of having murdered her husband in order to get control of the Washington Post, was another ranking member of the Club of Rome, as was Paul G. Hoffman of the New York Life Insurance Company, one of the largest insurance companies in the United States and a leading rank company, with ties directly to Queen Elizabeth of England's immediate family. John J. McCloy, the man who attempted to wipe post-World War II Germany off the map and last but not least James A. Perkins of the Carnegie Corporation, were also founding members of the Bilderbergers and the Club of Rome. What a star-studded cast! Yet strangely enough, few if any outside of genuine intelligence agencies had ever heard of this organization until recent times. The power exercised by these important personages and the corporations, television stations, newspapers, insurance companies and banks they represent matches the power and prestige of at least two European countries. And still this is only the tip of the Committee of 300's enormous cross-gridding and interfaced interests. Not mentioned in the foregoing lineup is Richard Gardner who, although an early member of the Committee of 300, was sent to Rome on a special assignment. Gardner married into one of the oldest black nobility families of Venice, thus providing the Venetian aristocracy a direct line to the White House. The late Avril Harriman was another of the committee's direct links with the Kremlin and the White House, a position which Kissinger inherited after the death of Harriman. The Club of Rome is indeed a formidable agency of the Committee of 300. Although ostensibly working on American affairs, the group overlaps other committee of 300 agencies and its United States members are often found working with problems, in Japan and Germany. Some of the front organizations operated by the above committee include the following, although not limited to them, League of Industrial Democracy officials, Michael Novak, Jean Kirkpatrick, Eugene Rostow, Erwin Suall, Lane Kirkland, Albert Schenker, purpose, to disrupt and disturb normal labor relations between workers and employees by brainwashing labor unions to make impossible demands with special attention to steel, automobile and housing industries. Freedom House officials, Leo Chern and Carl Gershman. Purpose, to spread socialist disinformation among American blue-collar workers, spread dissension and dissatisfaction. Now that these objectives have been largely realized Gershman has been drafted by Lawrence Eagleberger to CDC, a newly created body to stop a united Germany from expanding its trade into the Danube Basin. Committee for a Democratic Majority Officials, Ben Wattenberg, Jean Kirkpatrick, Elmo Zumwa and Mitch Dechter. Purpose, to provide a connecting link between the educated socialist class and minority groups with the intent of setting up a solid block of voters who can be counted on to vote for left-wing candidates at election time. It was really a Fabianist operation from start to finish. Foreign Policy Research Institute officials, Robert Stroh Hupe. Purpose, to undermine and eventually end NASA space program. Social Democrats U.S. A. Officials, Bayard Rustin, Lane Kirkland, J. Loveston, Carl Gershman, Howard Samuel, Sidney Hook. Purpose, to spread radical socialism, especially among minority groups, and forge links between similar organizations in socialist countries. Loveston was for decades the leading advisor to U.S. Presidents on Soviet affairs and a strong direct link with Moscow. Institute for Social Relations Officials, Harlan Cleveland, Willis Harmon. Purpose, change the way America thinks. The Citizens League officials, Barry Commoner. Purpose, to bring, common cause, legal suits against Vario U.S. government agencies, especially in the defense industries. War Resisters League officials, Noam Chomsky and David McReynolds. Purpose, to organize resistance to the Vietnam War among left-wing groups, students and the Hollywood, in crowd.
The Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee of the Institute for Democratic Socialism officials, Frank Sider, Arthur Redia, and David McReynolds. Purpose, a clearing house for left-wing socialist ideas and activities in the U.S. and Europe. Anti-Defamation League fact-finding division officials, Erwin Suall, also known as John Graham. Purpose, a joint FBI-British intelligence operation designed to single out right-wing groups and their leaders and put them out of business before they grow too large and too influential. International Association of Machinists Purpose, a labor-oriented front for the Socialist International in a hotbed of organized labor unrest polarizing workers and management. Amalgamated Clothing Workers Officials, Murray Findlay, Erwin Suall and Jacob Scheimkman. Purpose, much the same as the Machinists' Union, to socialize and polarize workers in the garment trade. A. Philip Randolph Institute officials, Bayard Rustin. Purpose, to provide a means of coordinating organizations with a common purpose, an example of which would be the spread of socialist ideas among college students and workers. Cambridge Policy Studies Institute officials, Gar Apple Ravitz. Purpose, to expand on the work being done at the Institute for Policy Studies. Founded in February 1969 by international socialist, Gar Apple Ravitz, former assistant to Senator Gaylord Nelson. Apple Ravitz wrote the controversial book Atomic Di Plomacy for the Club of Rome which work was financed by the German Marshall Fund. It concentrates on research and action, projects, with the stated goal of fundamentally changing American society, I. E to create a Fabianist United States in preparation of the coming One World Government. Economic Committee of the North Atlantic Institute officials, Dr. Aurelio Peque. Purpose, NATO think tank on global economic issues. Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions officials, founder Robert Hutchins of the Committee of 300, Harry Ashmore, Frank Kelly and a large group of fellows. Purpose, to spread ideas that will bring on social reforms of the liberal kind with democracy as an ideology. One of its activities is to draft a new constitution for the U.S., which will be strongly monarchical and socialistic as found in Denmark. The center is in, Olympian, stronghold. Located in Santa Barbara, it is housed in what is affectionately called, the Parthenon. Former Representative John Rarick called it, an outfit loaded with communists. By 1973 work on a new United States Constitution was in its 35th draft which proposes an amendment guaranteeing, environmental right, the thrust of which is to reduce the industrial base of the U.S. to a mere, whisper of what it was in 1969. In other words, this institution is carrying out Club of Rome zero-growth post-industrial policies laid down by the Committee of 300. Some of its other aims are control of economic cycles, welfare, regulation of business and national public works, control of pollution. Speaking on behalf of the Committee of 300, Ashmore says the function of the CSDI is to find ways and means of making our political system work more effectively. We must change education and we must consider a new U.S. Constitution and a Constitution for the world, Ashmore says. Further goals enunciated by Ashmore as follows. 1. Membership of the U.N. must be made universal. 2. The U.N. must be strengthened. 3. Southeast Asia must be neutralized. For neutralized red, communized. 4. Cold War must be ended. 5. Racial discrimination must be abolished. 6. Developing nations must be assisted. Meaning assisted to destruct. 7. No military solutions to problems. Pity they didn't tell George Bush that before the Gulf War. 8. National solutions are not adequate. 9. Coexistence is necessary. Harvard Psychological Clinic officials, Dr. Kurt Lewin and staff of 15 new science scientists. Purpose, to create a climate where the Committee of 300 can take unlimited power over the U.S. Institute for Social Research officials, Dr. 
Kurt Lewin and staff of 20 new science scientists. Purpose, to devise a whole new set of social programs to steer America away from industry. Science Policy Research Unit Officials, Leland Bradford, Kenneth Dam, Ronald Lippitt. Purpose, a Future Shocks, research institution at Sussex University in England and part of the Tavistock Network. Systems Development Corporation Officials, Sheldon Arenberg and a staff of hundreds, too numerous to mention here. Purpose, to coordinate all elements of the intelligence communities of the U.S. A. and Britain. It analyzes what players have to be assigned the role of a national entity. For example, Spain would come under a supine watered down Catholic Church, the U.N. under the Secretary General, and so forth. It developed the system of X ray 2, where think tank personnel, military installations, and law enforcement centers are all linked to the Pentagon through a nationwide network of teletypes and computers to apply surveillance techniques on a nationwide scale. Arenberg says his ideas are non military, but his techniques are mainly those he learned from the military. He was responsible for the New York State Identification and Intelligence System, a typical George Orwell 1984 project, which is completely illegal under our Constitution. The NYSIIS system is in the process of being adopted nationwide. It is what Bezhezinsk referred to as the ability to almost instantaneously retrieve data about any person. NYSIIS shares data with all law enforcement and government agencies in the state. It provides storage and rapid retrieval of individual records, criminal and social. It is a typical committee of 300 project. There is a crying need for a full investigation to be conducted into just what it is that Systems Development Corporation is doing, but that is beyond the scope of this book. One thing is sure, SDC is not there to preserve freedom and liberty guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. How convenient that it should be located in Santa Barbara in easy reach of Robert Hutchins, Parthenon. Some publications put out by these Club of Rome institutions are as follows, Center Magazine, Counter Spy, Coventry, Covert Action Information Bulletin, Descent, Human Relations, Industrial Research, Enquiry, Mother Jones, 1, Progressive, Reconteur, The New Republic, Working, Papers for a New Society, these are by no means all of the publications issued under the auspices of the Club of Rome. There are many hundreds more, in fact each of the foundations puts out its own publication. Given the number of foundations run by the Tavistock Institute and the Club of Rome, a partial listing is all we can include here. Some of the more important foundations and think tanks are in the following list, which includes army think tanks. The American public would be astounded if it only knew how deeply the Army is involved in new war tactics research with Committee of 300 think tanks. Americans are not aware that in 1946 the Club of Rome was ordered by the Committee of 300 to further the progress of think tanks which it said offered a new means of spreading the Committee's philosophy. The impact of these think tanks upon our military, just since 1959 when they suddenly proliferated, is truly astounding. There is no doubt that they will play an even greater role in the daily affairs of this nation as we come to the close of the 20th century. The Mont Pelerin Society Mont Pelerin is an economic foundation devoted to issuing misleading economic theories and influencing economists in the Western world to follow models it lays out from time to time. Its leading practitioners are von Hayek and Milton Friedman. The Hoover Institution founded originally to fight communism, the institution has slowly but surely turned towards socialism. It has an annual budget of $2 million, funded by companies under the umbrella of the Committee of 300. It now concentrates on peaceful changes, with emphasis on arms control and domestic Q.S. problems. It is frequently used by the news media as a conservative organization whose views they seek when a conservative viewpoint is needed. 
The Hoover Institution is far from that, and following the 1953 takeover of the institution by a group allied to the Club of Rome, it has become a one-world New World Order outlet for desirable policies. Heritage Foundation founded by brewery magnate Joseph Kors to act as a conservative think tank. Heritage was soon taken over by Fabianists Sir Peter Vickers Hall, Stuart Butler, Stephen Aisley, Robert Moss and Frederick von Hayek under the direction of the Club of Rome. This institute played a major role in carrying out British Labour leader Anthony Wedgwood Benn's order to Thatcherise Reagan. Heritage is certainly not a conservative operation although at times it may look and sound like one. Human Resources Research Office. This is an army research establishment dealing in psychotechnology. Most of its personnel are Tavistock trained. Psychotechnology covers key motivation, morale and music used by the enemy. In fact a lot of what George Orwell wrote about in his book, 1984, appears to be remarkably similar to what is taught at HUMRRO. In 1969, the Committee of 300 took over this important institution and turned it into a private non-profit organization run under the auspices of the Club of Rome. It is the largest behavioral research group in the U.S. One of its specialities is the study of small groups under stress and HUMRRO teaches the army that a soldier is merely an extension of his equipment and has brought great influence to bear on the man-weapon system and its human quality control, so widely accepted by the United States Army. HUMRRO has had a very pronounced effect on how the army conducts itself. Its mind-bending techniques are straight out of Tavistock. Humro's applied psychology courses are supposed to teach army brass how to make the human weapon work. A good example of this is the manner in which soldiers in the war against Iraq were willing to disobey their field manual standing orders and bury 12,000 Iraqi soldiers alive. This type of brainwashing is terribly dangerous because today, it is applied to the army. The army applies it to brutally destroy thousands of enemy soldiers, and tomorrow the army could be told that civilian population groups opposed to government policies are the enemy. We are already a mindless brainwashed flock of sheep, yet it seems that HUMRRO can take mind-bending and mind control a step further. HUMRRO is a valuable adjunct to Tavistock and many of the lessons taught at HUMRRO were applied in the Gulf War, which makes it a little easier to understand how it came to be that American soldiers behaved as ruthless and heartless killers. A far cry from the concept of the traditional American fighting man. Research Analyze Alls Corporation this is Humro's sister, 1984, organization situated in McLean, Virginia. Established in 1948, it was taken over by the Committee of 3MO in 1961 when it became part of the Johns Hopkins block. It has worked on over 600 projects, including integrating Negroes into the Army, the tactical use of nuclear weapons, psychological warfare programs and mass population control. Obviously there are many more major think tanks, and we shall come to most of them in this book. One of the most important areas of cooperation between what think tanks turn out and what becomes government and public policy are the pollsters. It is the job of the polling companies to mold and shape public opinion in the way that suits the conspirators. Polls are constantly being taken by CBS, NBC, ABC, The New York Times, The Washington Post. Most of these efforts are coordinated at the National Opinion Research Center where, as much as it will amaze most of us, a psychological profile was developed for the entire nation. Findings are fed into the computers of Gallup Poll and Jan Kelevich, Skelly and White for comparative evaluation. Much of what we read in our newspapers or see on television has first been cleared by the polling companies. What we see is what the pollsters think we should see. This is called public opinion making. The whole idea behind this bit of social conditioning is to find out how responsive the public is to policy directives handed down by the Committee of 300. We are called targeted population groups, and what is measured by the pollsters is how much resistance is generated to what appears in the nightly news. 
Later, we shall learn exactly how this deceptive practice got started and who is responsible for it. It is all part of the elaborate opinion-making process created at Tavistock. Today our people believe they are well informed but what they do not realize is that the opinions they believe are their own were in fact created in the research institutions and think tanks of America and that none of us are free to form our own opinions because of the information we are provided with by the media and the pollsters. Polling was brought to a fine art just before the United States entered the Second World War. Americans, unbeknown to themselves, were conditioned to look upon Germany and Japan as dangerous enemies who had to be stopped. In a sense, this was true, and that makes conditioned thinking all the more dangerous, because based on the informat Lynn fed to them, the enemy did indeed appear to be Germany and Japan. Just recently we saw how well Tavistock's conditioning process works when Americans were conditioned to perceive Iraq as a threat and Saddam Hussein as a personal enemy of the United States. Such a conditioning process is technically described as the message reaching the sense organs of persons to be influenced. One of the most respected of all pollsters is Committee of 300 member Daniel Yankelevich, of the company, Yankelevich, Skelly and White. Yankelevich is proud to tell his students that polling is a tool to change public opinion, although this is not original, Yankelevich having drawn his inspiration from David Naisbet's book, Trend Report, which was commissioned by the Club of Rome. In his book Naisbet describes all of the techniques used by public opinion makers to bring about the public opinion desired by the Committee of 300. Public opinion making is the jewel in the crown of the Olympians, for with their thousands of new science social scientists at their beck and call, and with the news media firmly in their hands. New public opinions on almost any subject can be created and disseminated around the world in a matter of two weeks. This is precisely what happened when their servant George Bush was ordered to make war on Iraq. Within two weeks, not only the U.S., but almost the entire world public opinion was turned against Iraq and its president Saddam Hussein. These media change artists and news manipulators report directly to the Club of Rome which in turn reports to the Committee of 300 at whose head sits the Queen of England ruling over a vast network of closely linked corporations who never pay taxes and are answerable to no one who fund their research institutions through foundations whose joint activities have almost total control over our daily lives. Together with their interlocking companies, insurance business, banks, finance corporations, oil companies, newspapers, magazines, radio and television, this vast apparatus sits astride the United States and the world. There is not a politician in Washington, D.C who is not, somehow, beholden to it. The left rails against it, calling it, imperialism, which indeed it is, but the left is run by the same people, the very same ones who control the right, so that the left is no more free than we are. Scientists engaged in the process of conditioning are called, social engineers, or, new science social scientists, and they play an integral part in what we see, hear and read. The old school social engineers were Kurt K. Lewin, Professor Hadley Cantrell, Margaret Mead, Professor Derwin Cartwright, and Professor Lipsit, who, together with John Rawlings Reese, made up the backbone of new science scientists at Tavistock Institute. During the Second World War, there were over 100 researchers at work under the direction of Kurt Lewin, copying slavishly the methods adopted by Reinhard Heydrich of the S. S. The OS was based on Heydrich's methodology As we know, the OS was the forerunner of the Central Intelligence Agency. The point of all this is that the governments of Britain and the United States already have the machinery in place to bring us into line in a new world order with only a slight modicum of resistance materializing, and this machinery has been in place since 1946. Each passing year has added new refinements. It is this committee of 300 which has established control networks and mechanisms far more binding than anything ever seen in this world. Chains and ropes are not needed to restrain us. Our fear of what is to come does that job far more efficiently than any physical means of restraint. 
We have been brainwashed to give up our constitutional right to bear arms, to give up our constitution itself, to allow the United Nations to exercise control over our foreign policies and the IMF to take control of our fiscal and monetary policies, to permit the President to break United States law with impunity and to invade a foreign country and kidnap its head of state. In short we have been brainwashed to the extent where we, as a nation, will accept each and every lawless act carried out by our government almost without question. I for one know that we will soon have to fight to reclaim our country from the committee, or lose it forever. But when it comes right down to it, how many will actually take up arms? In 1776 only 3% of the populace took up arms against King George III. This time around, 3% will be woefully inadequate. We should not allow ourselves to be led down dead-end roads, for that is what our mind controllers have planned for us by confronting us with such a complexity of issues that we simply succumb to long-range penetration and make no decisions at all on many vital issues. We shall be looking at the names of those who make up the Committee of 300 but, before we do that, we should examine the massive interfacing of all important institutions, companies and banks under the Committee's control. We must mark them well because these are the people who are deciding who shall live and who shall be eliminated as useless eaters, where we will worship God, what we must wear and even what we shall eat. According to Bezhezinsky, we shall be under endless surveillance around the clock for 365 days a year ad infinitum. That we have been betrayed from within is being accepted by more and more people each year, and that is good, because it is through knowledge, a word translated from the word belief, that we shall be able to defeat the enemies of all mankind. While we were being distracted by the bogey men in the Kremlin, the Trojan horse was moved into position in Washington, D.C. The greatest danger free people face today is not from Moscow but from Washington, D.C. We need first to conquer the domestic enemy, and after that we will be strong enough to mount an offensive to remove communism from the earth together with all of its attendant, ISMS. The Carter administration accelerated the collapse of our economy and our military strength, the latter begun by Club of Rome and Lucci's trust member Robert Strange McNamara. In spite of his promises, Reagan continued to undermine our industrial base, starting where Carter left off. While we need to keep our defenses strong, we cannot do that from a weak industrial base for, without a well-run military-industrial complex, we cannot have a viable defense system. The Committee of 300 recognizes this and planned from 1953 its zero-growth post-industrial policies now in full flower. Thanks to the Club of Rome our technology potential has dropped below that of Japan and Germany, nations we are supposed to have defeated in the Second World War. How has this come about? Because of men like Dr. Alexander King and our blindfolded state of mind, we have failed to recognize the destruction of our educational institutions and systems of teaching. As a result of our blindness, we are no longer training engineers and scientists in sufficient numbers to keep us among the industrialized nations of the world. Thanks to Dr. King, a man very few people in America know about education in the U.S is at its lowest level since 1786. Statistics produced by the Institute for Higher Learning show that the reading and writing capabilities of high school children in the United States are lower than they were among high school children in 1786. What we face today is not only the loss of our freedom and the very fabric of our nation, but far worse, the possibility of the loss of our souls. The steady chipping away at the foundation upon which this republic rests has left an empty void, which Satanists and cultists are rushing to fill with their synthetic soul material. This truth is difficult to accept and appreciate because there was nothing sudden about these events. If a sudden shock were to hit us, a cultural and religious shock, we would be shaken out of our apathy. But gradualism, which is what Fabianism is, does nothing to raise the alarm because the vast majority of Americans can see no motivation for the things I have described, they cannot accept it, and so the conspiracy is scorned and often mocked. 
by creating chaos through presenting hundreds of daily choices our people have to make, we have come down to a position where, unless motivation can be clearly shown, all information is rejected. This is both the weak and the strong link in the conspiratorial chain. Most thrust aside anything that has no motive, so the conspirators feel safe behind the ridicule poured upon those who point to the coming crisis in our nation and our individual lives. However, if we can get enough people to see the truth, the motivation block gets weaker until it will eventually be forced aside as more and more people become enlightened and the notion that this cannot happen in America is dispensed with. The Committee of 300 is counting on our maladaptive responses to govern our reaction to created events, and it will not be disappointed as long as we as a nation continue in the present way we respond. We must turn responses to created crises into adaptive responses by identifying the conspirators and exposing their plans for us, so that these things become public knowledge. The Club of Rome has already made the transition to barbarism. Instead of waiting to be raptured, we must stop the Committee of 300 before it can accomplish its goal of making us prisoners of the new Dark Age planned for us. It is not up to God, it is up to U.S. We have to take the necessary action. All information that I provide in this book comes from years of research backed up by impeccable intelligence sources. Nothing is exaggerated. It is factual and precise, so do not fall into the trap set by the enemy that this material is disinformation. For the past two decades I have provided information which has proved to be highly accurate and which has explained a lot of puzzling events. My hope is that through this book, a better, clearer and wider understanding of the conspiratorial forces ranged against this nation will come about. That hope is being realized as more and more young people are beginning to ask questions and seek information about what is really going on. It is difficult for people to comprehend that these conspirators are real and that they have the power I and many others have attributed to them. Many have written to ask how it is that our government does nothing about the terrible threat to civilization. The problem is that our government is part of the problem, part of the conspiracy, and nowhere and at no time has this become more clearly evident than during the Bush presidency. Of course President Bush knows precisely what the Committee of 300 is doing to us. He works for them. Others have written to say, we thought we were fighting the government. Of course we are, but behind government stands a force so powerful and all-encompassing that intelligence agencies are even afraid to mention the name, Olympians. Proof of the Committee of 300 is found in the vast number of powerful institutions owned and controlled by it. Listed here are some of the more important ones, all of which come under the mother of all think tanks and research institutions, the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations with its far-flung network of hundreds of branches. Stanford Research Center Stanford Research Center, SRC, was founded in 1946 by the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations. Stanford was created to help Robert Zero. Anderson and his Arco Oil Company, who had secured for the Committee of 300 the oil rights on the north slope of Alaska. Basically, the job was too large for Anderson's Aspen Institute to handle, so a new center had to be founded and funded. That new center was Stanford Research Center. Alaska sold its rights on a down payment of $900 million, a relatively small amount for the Committee of 300. The governor of Alaska was steered to Shree for help or advice. This was no accident but the result of judicious planning and a process of long-range conditioning. Following the governor's call for help, three Shri scientists set up shop in Alaska where they met with the Alaskan Secretary of State and the State Planning Office. Francis Grian, who headed the Shri team, assured the governor that his problem of how to handle the rich oil find would be safe in the hands of Shri. Naturally Grian did not mention the Committee of 300 or the Club of Rome. In less than a month Green assembled a team of economists, petroleum scientists and new science scientists numbering in the hundreds. The report Shri gave to the governor ran to 88 pages. The proposal was adopted virtually without change by the Alaska legislature in 1970. Green had indeed done a remarkable job for the Committee of 300. 
From this beginning Sri developed into an institution employing 4,000 people with an annual budget of $160 million plus. Its president, Charles A. Anderson, has seen much of this growth during his tenure, as has Professor Willis Harmon, director of the Sri Center for the Study of Social Policies, employing hundreds of new science scientists, many of the top staffers having been transferred from Tavistock's London base. One of those was RCA board chairman and former British intelligence agent, David Sarnoff, who was closely involved with Harmon and his team for 25 years. Sarnoff was something of a watchdog for the Mother Institute in Sussex. Stanford claims to make no moral judgments on projects it accepts, working for Israel and the Arabs, South Africa and Libya but, as one would imagine, by adopting this attitude it ensures an inside edge with foreign governments that the CIA has found most useful. In Jim Ridgway's book, The Closed Corporation, Shri spokesman Gibson brags about Shri's non-discriminatory stance. Although not on the federal contract research center lists, Shri is today the largest military think tank, dwarfing Hudson and Rand. Among cells, speciality departments are chemical and biological warfare experimental centers. One of Stanford's more dangerous activities is counterinsurgency operations aimed at civilian populations just the sort of 1984 things government is already using against its own people. The U.S. government pays three millions of dollars each year for this kind of highly controversial research. Following student protests against chemical warfare experiments conducted at Stanford, Shri sold itself to a private group for just $25 million. Of course nothing really changed, Shri was still a Tavistock project and the committee of 300 still owned it, but the gullible appeared to be satisfied by this meaningless cosmetic change. In 1958 a startling new development arose. Advanced Research Products Agency, ARPA, a contracting agency for the Defense Department, approached Shri with a top-secret proposal. John Foster at the Pentagon told Shri that what was needed was a program to ensure the United States against technological surprise. Foster wanted to perfect a condition where the environment became a weapon, special bombs to trigger volcanoes and or earthquakes, behavioral research on potential enemies and minerals and metals with potential for new weapons. The project was accepted by Shri and codenamed, Shaky. The massive electronic brain in Shaky was capable of carrying out many commands, its computers having been constructed by IBM for Shri. 28 scientists worked on what is called human augmentation. The IBM computer even has the capability to solve problems by analogy and recognizes and identifies scientists who work with it. The special applications of this tool can be better imagined than described. Bezhezinsky knew what he was talking about when he wrote the TECHNOTRONIC era. Stanford Research Institute works closely with scores of civilian consulting firms, trying to apply military technology to domestic situations. This has not always been a success, but as techniques improve, the prospects for massive all-pervading surveillance, as described by Bezhezinsky, daily becomes more real. It already exists and is in use, even though slight malfunctions from time to time have to be ironed out. One such civilian consulting firm was Shriva McKee Associates of McLean, Virginia, run by retired General Bernard A. Shriva, a former chief of the Air Force Systems Command, who developed the Titan, Thor, Atlas and Minuteman rockets. Shriva put together a consortium of Lockheed, Emerson Electric, Northrop, Control Data, Raytheon and TRW under the name of Urban Systems Associates, Inc. The purpose of the consortium to solve social and psychological urban problems by means of military techniques using advanced electronic systems. It is interesting to note that TRW became the largest credit information collecting company in the credit reporting business as a result and an outcome of its work with Urban Systems Associates, Inc. This should tell us a great deal about just how far this nation is already under total surveillance, which is the first requirement of the Committee of 300.
No dictatorship, ESP clearly not one on a global scale, can function without total control over each and every individual. SHRI was well on its way to becoming a key committee of 300 research organization. By the 1980s, 60% of Searle's contracts were devoted to futurism, with both military and civilian applications. Its major clients were the U.S. Department of Defense Directorate of Defense Research and Engineering, Office of Aerospace Research which dealt with applications of the behavioral sciences to research management, Executive Office of the President, Office of Science and Technology, U.S. Department of Health. On behalf of the Department of Health, Shri ran a program called Patterns in ESDEA Title I Reading Achievement Tests. Other clients were the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Transportation and the National Science Foundation, NSF. Of significance was the paper developed for NSF, entitled to Assessment of Future and International Problems. Stanford Research, under the tutelage of Tavistock Institute in London, put together a far-reaching and chilling system it called Business Intelligence Program. In excess of 600 companies in the U.S. and abroad became subscribers. The program covered research in Japanese foreign business relations, consumer marketing in a period of change, the mounting challenge of international terrorism, sensory evaluation in consumer products, electronic funds transfer system, optoelectric sensing, exploratory planning methods. The U.S. Defense Industry and Capital Availability among the top committee of 300 companies who became clients of this program were Bechtel Corporation, George Schultz was on its board, Hewlett-Packard, TRW, Bank of America, Shell Company, RCA, Blythe, Eastman Dillon, Saga Foods Corporation, McDonnell Douglas, Crown Zellerback, Wells Fargo Bank and Kaiser Industries. But one of the most sinister of all Shri programs with the possibilities of doing tremendous damage in altering the direction in which the United States will go, socially, morally and religiously, was Stanford's Charles F. Kettering Foundation's Changing Images of Man, under Stanford official reference, contract number URH4892150 Policy Research Report number 4 April 74, prepared by the Shri Center for the Study of Social Policy, Director Willis Harmon. This is probably one of the most far-reaching investigations into how man might be changed that has ever been conducted. The report, covering 319 pages, was written by 14 new science scientists under the supervision of Tavistock and 23 top controllers including B. F. Skinner, Margaret Mead, Irvin Laszlo and Sir Geoffrey Vickers, a high-level British intelligence officer in M16. It will be recalled that his son-in-law, Sir Peter Vickers Hall, was a founding member of the so-called Conservative Heritage Foundation. Much of the 3,000 pages of recommendations given to the Reagan administration in January 1981 were based upon material taken from Willis Harmon's Changing Images of Man. I was privileged to receive a copy of the Changing Images of Man from my intelligence colleagues five days after it was accepted by the United States government. What I read shocked me, as I realized I was looking at a blueprint for a future America, unlike anything I had ever seen before. The nation was to be programmed to change and become so accustomed to such planned changes that it would hardly be noticeable when profound changes did occur. We have gone downhill so fast since the Aquarian Conspiracy, the book title of Willis Harmon's technical paper, was written, that today, divorce draws no stigma, suicide is at an all-time high and raises few eyebrows, social deviations from the norm and sexual aberrations. Once unmentionable in decent circles, are now commonplace and excite no special protest. As a nation we have not noticed how, changing images of mankind, has radically altered our American way of life forever. Somehow we were overcome by the, Watergate syndrome. For a while we were shocked and dismayed to learn that Nixon was nothing but a cheap crook who hobnobbed with Earl Warren's mafia friends at the beautiful home they built for him adjoining the Nixon estate. 
When too many future shocks and news headlines demanded our attention, we lost our way, or rather, the huge number of choices with which we were and still are daily confronted, confused us to such a degree that we were no longer able to make the necessary choices. Worse yet, having been subjected to a barrage of crimes in high places, plus the trauma of the Vietnam War, our nation seemed no longer to want truths. Such reaction is carefully explained in Willis Harmon's technical paper, in short, the American nation was reacting exactly as profiled. Worse yet, in not wishing to accept truth, we took matters a step further, we looked to government to shield us from the truth. The corrupt stench of the Reagan-Bush administrations we wanted covered with six feet of earth. The crimes committed under the title of Iran, Contra Affair, or scandals, we didn't want uncovered. We let our president lie to us regarding his whereabouts in the period October 20-23 Road, 1980. Yet these crimes far exceed in quantity and scope anything Nixon did while he was in office. Do we as a nation recognize it as going downhill with our brakes off? No, we do not. When those whose business it is to bring the truth to the American people that a private, well-organized little government inside the White House was busy committing one crime after another, crimes which attacked the very soul of this nation and the Republican institutions upon which it rested, we were told not to bother the public with such things. We really don't want to know about all this speculation, became a standard response. When the highest elected official of the land blatantly put you, N. Law above the Constitution of the United States an impeachable offense, the majority accepted it as normal. When the highest elected official of the land went to war without a congressional declaration of war, the fact was censored out by the news media and, again, we accepted it rather than face the truth. When the Gulf War, which our president plotted and planned, began, not only were we happy with censorship of the most blatant kind, we even took it to our hearts, believing that it was good to all the war effort. Our president lied, April Glaspie lied, the State Department lied. They said the war was justified because President Hussein had been warned to leave Kuwait alone. When Glaspie's cables to the State Department were finally made public, one United States senator after another went charging to defend Glaspie, the harlot. It mattered not that they came from both the Democrats and the Republicans. We, the people, let them get away with their vile lies. In this public attitude of the American people, the wildest dreams of Willis Harmon and his teams of scientists became a reality. The Tavistock Institute was elated at its success in destroying the self-respect and self-esteem of this once great nation. We are told that we won the Gulf War. What is not yet perceived by the vast majority of Americans is that, in winning the war, it cost the self-respect and honor of our nation. That lies rotting in the desert sands of Kuwait and Iraq, alongside the corpses of the Iraqi soldiers we butchered in the agreed retreat from Kuwait and Basra we could not keep our word that we would abide by the Geneva Conventions and not attack them. What do you want? Our controllers asked us, victory or self-respect? You can't have both. One hundred years ago, this could not have happened, but now it has happened and excites no comment. We have succumbed to the long-range penetration warfare waged against this nation by Tavistock. Like the German nation, defeated by the Prudential Bombing Survey, enough of us have succumbed to make this nation the kind that totalitarian regimes of the past would have only envisaged in their dreams. Here, they would say, is a nation, one of the largest in the world, that doesn't want the truth. All of our propaganda agencies can be dispensed with. We don't have to struggle to keep the truth from this nation, they have willingly rejected it of their own volition. This nation is a pushover. Our once proud Republic of the United States of America became no more than a series of criminal front organizations, which history shows is always the start of totalitarianism. This is the stage of permanent alteration we are at in America as 1991 drew to a close. We live in a throwaway society, programmed not to last. We do not even flinch at the 4 million homeless nor the 30 million jobless, nor the 15 million babies murdered thus far. 
They are throw ways of the age of Aquarius, a conspiracy so damnable that, when first confronted with it, the majority will disavow its existence, rationalizing these events as times have changed. This is how the Tavistock Institute and Willis Harmon programmed us to react. Dismantling of our ideals goes on without protest. The spiritual and intellectual drive of our people has been destroyed. On May 27, 1991, President Bush made a very profound statement, the thrust of which appears to have been totally misused by most political commentators, the moral dimension of American policy requires us to chart a moral course through a world of lesser evils. That is the real world, not black and white. Very few moral absolutes. What else could we expect from a president who is most probably the most evil man ever to occupy the White House? What else could we expect from a president who is most probably the most evil man ever to occupy the White House? Consider this in the light of his order to the military to bury alive 12,000 Iraqi soldiers. Consider this in the light of his ongoing war of genocide against the Iraqi people. President Bush was delighted to characterize President Saddam Hussein as the Hitler of our times. He never bothered to offer a single scrap of proof. It was not needed. Because President Bush made the statement, we accepted it without question. Consider this in the bright light of truth, that he did all of these things in the name of the American people while secretly taking his orders from the Committee of 300. But, more than anything else, consider this, President Bush and his controllers feel so secure that they no longer deem it necessary to hide their evil control of the American people, or to lie about it. This is self-evident in the statement that he, as our leader, will make all manner of compromises with truth, honesty and decency if his controllers, and ours, deem it necessary. On May 27, 1991, the President of the United States abandoned each and every principle embodied in our Constitution and boldly proclaimed that he was no longer bound by it. This is a great victory for the Tavistock Institute and the Prudential Bombing Survey, whose target changed from German worker housing in 1945 to the soul of the American people in a war that began in 1946 and runs through to 1992. Increased pressure on this nation for change was applied by Stanford Research Institute in the early 1960s. Searle's offensive gathered power and momentum. Switch on your television set and you will see Stanford's victory in front of your very eyes, talk shows featuring heavy sexual details, special video channels where perversion, rock and roll and drugs reign supreme. Where once John Wayne ruled, we now have a made-over apology for a man, or is he? Called Michael Jackson, a parody of a human being who is held up as a hero, as he gyrates, shuffles, mumbles and screams his way across television screens in millions of American homes. A woman who has been through a series of marriages gets national coverage. One filthy, half-washed, drug-ridden, decadent rock band after another has hours of airtime devoted to its inane sounds and mad gyrations, clothes, fashions and language aberrations. Soap operas showing as near as damn it is to wearing pornographic scenes draw no comment. Whereas in early 1960 this would never have been tolerated, today it is accepted as normal. We have been subjected and we have succumbed to what Tavistock Institute calls future shocks, whose future is now and we are so numbed by one cultural shock after another that to protest seems like a futile gesture and, therefore, logically we think, it does no good to protest. In 1986 the Committee of 300 ordered the pressure turned up. The U.S. was not going down fast enough. The United States began the process of recognizing the butchers of Cambodia, the criminal Pol Pot regime, self-confesses to the murder of two million Cambodian citizens. In 1991, the wheel turned the full circle.
The United States went to war against a friendly nation that had been programmed to trust the Washington traitors. We accused President Hussein of the small nation of Iraq of all manner of evil, none of which was even remotely true. We killed and maimed its children, we left him to starve and to die of all manner of diseases. In the same breath we sent the Bush emissaries of the Committee of 300 to Cambodia to recognize the evil mass murderers of two million Cambodians, who were sacrificed by the Committee of 300's depopulation of cities experiment, which the big cities of the United States will experience in the not-too-distant future. Now, President Bush and his Committee of 300 ridden administration say, in effect, look people, what do you want from me? I told you that I will compromise where I see fit, even when that means sleeping with the Pol Pot murderers. So what kiss my hips? The level of pressure for change will reach its peak in 1993 and we shall witness scenes such as we would never have thought possible. Punch drunk America will react but ever so slightly. Not even the latest threat to our freedom. The personal computer card disturbs us. Willis Harmon's changing images of man would have been too technical for most so the service of Marilyn Ferguson was obtained to make it more easily understood. The Age of Aquarius heralded nude stage shows and a song which made the top of the charts, the dawning of the Age of the Aquarius, swept the globe. The personal computer card which, when fully distributed, will deprive us of our familiar environment and, as we shall see, environment means a lot more than the usually accepted meaning of the word. The United States has gone through a period of intense trauma such as has never been visited on any other nation in the history of the world, and the worst is yet to come. Everything is going according to what Tavistock ordered and what the social scientists at Stanford mapped out. Times do not change, they are made to change. All changes are pre-planned and come as the result of careful action. We have been changed gradually at first, but now the pace of change is picking up. The United States is being transformed from one nation under God to a polyglot of nations under several gods. The U.S. is no longer a one nation under God. The framers of the Constitution have lost the battle. Our forebears spoke a common language and believed in a common religion, Christianity, and held common ideals. There were no aliens in our midst, that came later in a deliberately planned attempt to break up the United States into a series of fragmented nationalities, cultures and beliefs. If you doubt this, go down to the east side of New York, or the west side of Los Angeles on any given Saturday and look around you. The United States has become several nations struggling to coexist under a common system of government. When the floodgates of immigration were opened wide by Franklin D. Roosevelt, a cousin of the head of the Committee of 300, the cultural shock caused great confusion and dislocation and made one nation an unworkable concept. The Club of Rome and NATO have exacerbated the situation. Love thy neighbor is an ideal that will not work unless your neighbor is as yourself. To the framers of our Constitution, the truths they laid out for future generations were self-evident, to themselves being unsure that future generations would also find the truths to which they bound this nation self-evident, they set about spelling them out. It seems that they were afraid of a time that might come when the truths they espoused would no longer be self-evident. The Tavistock Institute for Human Relations has made sure that what the framers feared might come to pass has indeed come to pass. That time has arrived with Bush and his no absolutes, and his new world order under the Committee of 300. This is part of the concept of social change as forced upon Americans which Harmon and the Club of Rome said would make for severe trauma and a great building up of pressure. The social upheavals that have taken place since the advent of Tavistock, the Club of Rome and NATO will continue in the U.S. for as long as the limit of absorption is ignored. Nations are made up of individuals and, like individuals, there is a limit to their ability to absorb changes, no matter how robust they may be. This psychological truth was well proven by the strategic bombing survey which called for saturation bombing of German worker housing. 
As mentioned earlier, the project was the work of the Prudential Insurance Company and no one doubts today that Germany suffered its defeat because of this operation. Many of the scientists who worked on that project are working on saturation bombing of America, or else they have passed on, leaving their skilled techniques in the hands of others who followed behind them. The legacy they left behind and can be found in the fact that we have not so much lost our way as a nation, but that we have been steered in a direction opposite to that which the framers of the Declaration guided us for over 200 years. We have, in short, lost contact with our historical genes, our faith, which inspired countless generations of Americans to move forward as a nation, benefiting from the patrimony left to us by the framers of the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. That we are lost is clear to all who seek the truth, as unpleasant as it may be. With President Bush and his no absolute morals guiding us, we blunder ahead as lost nations and individuals tend to do. We are collaborating with the Committee of 300 for our own downfall and our own enslavement. Some sense it and feel a strong sense of unease. The various conspiracy theories they are familiar with do not seem to cover it all. This is because they know nothing of the conspirators' hierarchy, the Committee of 300. These souls who feel a deep sense of unease and that something is radically wrong, yet cannot put their collective fingers on the problem, walk in darkness. They look to a future they see slipping away from them. The American dream has become a mirage. They place their faith in religion but take no steps to help that faith along by action. Americans will never experience a retracing of steps such as the Europeans experienced when at the height of the Dark Ages. By determined Acklin, they awoke in themselves a spirit of renewal which resulted in the glorious Renaissance. The enemy that has directed them to this point decided to make a strong move against the United States in 1980, so that Renaissance of America would be impossible. Who is the enemy? The enemy is no faceless, they. The enemy is clearly identifiable as the Committee of 300, the Club of Rome, NATO and all of its affiliated organizations, the think tanks and research institutions controlled by Tavistock. There is no need to use they or the enemy except as shorthand. We know who they, the enemy, is. The Committee of 300 with its Eastern liberal establishment, aristocracy, its banks, insurance companies, giant corporations, foundations, communications networks, presided over by a hierarchy of conspirators this is the enemy. This is the power that brought to life the reign of terror in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution, World Wars I and II, Korea, Vietnam, the fall of Rhodesia, South Africa, Nicaragua, and the Philippines. This is the secret upper-level government that brought into existence the controlled disintegration of the U.S. economy and deindustrialized what was once the greatest industrial power, for good, that the world had ever known. America today can be compared with a soldier who falls asleep in the thick of battle. We Americans have fallen asleep, given way to apathy caused by being confronted with a multiplicity of choices which has confused us. These are the changes that alter our environment, break down our resistance to change so that we become dazed, apathetic and eventually fall asleep in the thick of battle. There is a technical term for this condition. It is called long-range penetration strain. The art of subjecting a very large group of people to continued long-range penetration strain was developed by scientists working out of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations in their U.S subsidiaries, Stanford Research and Rand Corporation, and at least another 150 research institutions here in the U.S. Dr. Kurt Lewin, the scientist who developed this fiendish warfare, has caused the average American patriot to fret over various conspiracy theories, leaving him or her with a feeling of uncertainty and insecurity, isolated and perhaps even afraid, as he searches but fails to understand the decay and rot caused by the changing images of mankind, unable to identify or combat the social, moral, economic and political changes he deems undesirable and does not want, yet which increase in intensity on every hand. Dr. 
Lewin's name will not be found in any of our establishment history books which, in any event, are a record of events mostly from the side of the ruling class or the victors of wars. Therefore, it is with pride that I introduce his name to you. As mentioned before, drive. Lewin organized the Harvard Psychological Clinic and the Institute for Social Research under the auspices of the Tavistock Institute. The names do not give much indication of the purpose of the two organizations. This reminds me of the infamous bill to reform coinage and mint laws passed in 1827. The title of the bill was harmless enough or sounded harmless, which was the intention of its backers. Through this act, Senator John Sherman betrayed the nation into the hands of the international bankers. Sherman allegedly sponsored the bill, without reading it. As we know, the bill's true purpose was to demonetize silver and give the thieving bankers unlimited power over the credit of our nation, powers to which the bankers were clearly not entitled under the clear and unmistakable terms of the U.S. Constitution.